the directors and curators, registrars, uh, interns, volunteers of local historical societies who helped uh, provide uh, images when I um, knew a sampler existed but didn't have an image of it or didn't have a good enough image of it. So thank you very much for the time and energy you did that. And then also, it, I want to thank all the museums and historical societies, historic homes, private collectors, dealers, who shared their sampler on the Sampler Archive Project. And I'll talk just briefly about that so you know what that is. Um, many of the images that I'm sharing with you, I pulled from the Sampler Archive Project because it's easy, easily accessible. Uh, and it's accessible to everyone, not just to me. So, um, <clears throat> I guess that's my, I'm sure there are people that I forgot. And thank you for being here, because uh, there would be no presentation if, if you weren't sitting here. Uh, Alan asked me to um, talk a little bit about the Sampler Archive Project, just so you know what it is. I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, this is a, a many year we've been involved seriously since about 2008, and have funding since, uh, federal funding since 2011 off and on. And the, uh, the goal is to find and get high resolution images of and document um, all American samplers. So, uh, and people say, well, all American samplers, how, well, I said, why would we stop <laughs> at 80% or something, 90% or something. So we just say, oh, we'll never make that, but why not have that be the goal? So the goal is to find, uh, uh, locate them, and uh, get high resolution images of them. And also we document on three um, major <clears throat> topics. One is physical characteristics, so we describe everything that we see on a sampler using protocols that were put together by experts around the country, experts in sampler uh, scholarship. And um, the second is on maker family history, so we do geneal genealogy uh, research, on, genealogical research on the samplers in order to um, identify where the girls came from, if we possibly can, and where, where the sampler was made. And then thirdly, we um, record information about what we call object history, or called provenance, um, the, wh what has happened to the object, to the sampler, since it was made. Where has it been? Has it been exhibited? Has it, has it uh, shown up in uh, literature someplace? So, and all that information is in the sampler archive for um, uh, a large number of samplers. And I'll tell you, you're the first people to hear this. Um, we've been up in Vermont doing what we call sampler ID days. It's kind of like Antiques Roadshow, but there's no appraisal. You just bring it in and we photograph it and we document it. The, really, really fun. We did uh, 110 samplers in two days, which was a, a large number, phenomenal. And we reached, I, I got a kick out of this when we reached 5,555. <laughs> <laughs> that number there. It's now a little bit more because we passed that number, but it was, it was kind of a milestone that I could remember. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in the sampler archive, um, you're able to browse, I should have said, well, this one was up. You're able to browse um, the, the database online. Anybody can do it on these dimensions. And then you'll see there's a search up in the top right-hand corner. And that allows you to put in um, any, a variety of details. If you want all samplers from the, made by a girl's name, Mary, you can put that in and you can get all of them. And they come from all of the, um, uh, museums and historical societies who have contributed their, their samplers. And that, that's growing every day, as you can imagine. Um, <coughs> this site is a search, I think this was family record samplers, which are uh, samplers that have, have uh, genealogical information on them, family genealogical information. And you can see already, in just looking at these, that some come from the Rhode Island Historical Society, some come from the DAR Museum in Washington, D.C., and the list is much, much longer than what, what you're able to see, but it becomes unreadable if I put all, all that in. Um, so it, the, the advantage is that it pulls together things from, from all over, and so you don't have to go looking at this museum, this museum, this museum, in order to find things. Um, if you click on any one of those, you get um, uh, what we call the 
Stone <laughs> version of the information uh, about the sampler and about the girl. And, uh, and you get a larger image. And if you see underneath, uh, well, you don't see it. It's not in the photo. But underneath that photo, there is a thing that says enlarge this. And then you get a really big high resolution image that you can zoom into. And if we have been able to do our own photography, when you zoom in it into it, you can see individual stitches. Mm -hmm. So we get down to that level. So it's really great fun. Now some of them, uh, some of our images are archival and are not that as good, but we try to get as the best we can. So, and then below this, which you're not seeing, is uh, there are uh, fold-out pages that one for physical characteristics, one for maker family history, and one for optic history. The three areas of uh, records that we uh, record information. Okay, so that's a very brief overview. I can spend a whole hour just talking about that and exploring that with you, but at least you kind of understand, I guess, uh, what I represent, the, the National Sampler Archive Project, and how I spend my waking hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Alan also asked if I would um, kind of give a little bit of an overview of samplers. We're not, make, not assume that you knew anything about it. So I labeled it Samplers 101, and I'm only going to share four things, okay? There's, I mean, many hundreds of things I could share, but these four things are essential to know about um, samplers. And some of them are things that um, most people don't know, or they know some myth related to it. So the first thing is that um, needlework was an essential component of the curriculum. The samplers that you're going to see in my presentation, the samplers over there, almost all of them were done in school. They're not done at home. They're not done at Mother's Knee. They're not done by a fireside. They're done in schools. And so, and needlework was an absolutely essential part of the curriculum. And in, for some schools and in some periods of time, it was not only essential, it was maybe the only part of the curriculum. I mean, just uh, needlework, it was it felt to be the essential thing that uh, girls and women needed to know. It was so important um, when, that when teachers advertised, they would make sure you knew they were going to cover the most important things. And it, all, they always mentioned needlework. So here are two advertisements for schools. Uh, and they're both designed to appeal to young ladies and especially to their parents as well. And you can see that needlework is mentioned in both of them and in some of them it's mentioned multiple times. So on the left is an ad by Mr. and Mrs. Touche. I don't know if that's how they pronounce it, or Touche. Is that a local name? No, okay. We'll go with Touche. Um, they advertised their Northampton Academy for young ladies in uh, 1807. And they, were, they said, and I quote here, it will embrace all the useful and ornamental branches of female education. Okay. And they add, then elaborates with the words, elegant accomplishments. And then in caps, drawing, painting, embroidery. Okay. These are the ornamental branches of uh, instruction. And then finish up by saying, in a style practiced by the most <coughs> eminent masters in Europe. So they're really touting their skills as instructors and instructresses. The other ad is a, ad that a, um, for a school in South Hadley that was to be opened in 1809. You know, sometimes these schools actually never open. So <laughs> they're great ads, they don't get any students and they go somewhere else. But, uh, so I, I don't know if these actually operated, but the ads did appear. Um, this was to be opened in 1809 by a Miss Hayes. And uh, first she mentions its academic curriculum, reading, writing, English, grammar, geography, and rhetoric. And then, without pause, she says, and painting, embroidery, and filigree. And just so you get the point, she assures the reader there will be instruction on all kinds of needlework. Okay. All kinds of needlework. So she's really making needlework uh, shine there. So, um, in reality, teachers would not get female students if they didn't advertise uh, that, that needlework was part of their curriculum. And even schools that are, were well known for their high academic scholarship and their high academic uh, expectations on students, they also had needlework curriculum. Like Litchfield Academy in Connecticut, they also had needlework and drawing and painting. Uh, Emma Bullard School in, um, in uh, Troy, New York, also 
high, highly uh, focused on academics, it also had me. Okay, secondly, um, that there were many different types of needlework. They're not all this, the same. That will become even more clear as I go through. But just quickly, um, many of them, and maybe I would say most of the samplers you see are some combination of alphabets and verses. And then, of course, the girls usually sign them as well. These are three examples. By the way, I took as many examples as I could from um, Massachusetts. Um, and these are uh, the types of samplers that occur most in Massachusetts. There are others that I'm not going to show you because I never see them in Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> so the, these are three examples. You'll notice, and this will be true of uh, all of the images, there will be the name of the, the person and the year. Um, it may or may not say the, the town um, because it may be all of them may be from a single town. And then where the owner of the, uh, the sampler is listed underneath, and where it's, I pulled it from the sampler archive, you'll see an SA number. That stands for sampler archive. So it's sampler archive on the one on the left, 002326. And uh, Shelburne Museum one, these are some that we were doing up in, in Vermont, uh, 005185, on our way to 5555. <laughs> Uh, another kind of uh, sampler that's very popular are family record samplers. These are just two variations or many different formats. Um, very popular the first third of the um, 19th century to create um, genealogical records of the family and in stitching. And boys often did them, by the way, in pen and ink and drawing too. It's, it's not just a girl's thing, but girls most often did them in um, embroidery. And then third, that the, if you were a girl and got to stay in school longer, uh, you might um, transition into doing something like this uh, silk on silk embroidery. Some of them had biblical themes, some of them had themes from literature, some of them had more, what, what are called mourning embroideries, and they, these were mourning dead people. Um, oftentimes somebody in the family or somebody famous like George Washington. Third thing is that samplers changed their appearance and their purpose across time. So here's just a few, but you'll see the drastic differences. On the left is a um, band sampler. It's not in great shape, but it's, it's local, so I wanted to um, include it. It's from Hatfield. It's very unusual in that most band samplers, which were created mostly in the 1600s, um, are made silk, silk on linen, and this is one of only two that are known that are, are wool and linen. And uh, I think that argues for it being made locally, because the, if it were made in Boston or something like that, I, it would be silk. And I think that's great, <laughs> because we like to see these things locally. Uh, the one in the middle from uh, Northampton, a very um, elegant, but entirely stitched. You'll see more of these later. Up on the top right is one, there is a, um, around the 1830s, became very popular to have uh, what are called Berlin uh, patterns. And these were uh, patterns where they just literally told you where to put every stitch and even when the colors were supposed to change. And so it's a little bit like paint by numbers, which probably, hopefully you all remember. That's not <laughs> so outdated. Um, and uh, the top. Uh, one on the top is, is like that, it's a nice border, but it also has this large uh, pattern. That is not a design a girl made up or even a teacher made up. That's a pattern, it's a purchased pattern. And then down at the uh, bottom, I just wanted to in include that one because it's um, made, it's a family record, but it's made by an older woman. And um, so, it, and it's in uh, wool, wool thread on, on the um, uh, fabric there. So they changed, Changed the size, changed the appearance, changed the materials, uh, and the wool didn't start coming back in until the, um, around the 1840s. So um, up until that time, mostly most of the samplers are silk on linen. That's probably more than you want to know. And uh, now we'll go to the last of my four important points, and that is that most girls probably made more than one sampler. And that that's important to know. Like I said, these are done in schools. Sometimes they went to school briefly, you know, maybe a year, two years, three years, 
And but you but the entire time they're in school, they're making samplers. It's not it's not like you just go and sampler making uh, is the first month or something like that. It can occur often. And sometimes I see I happen to collect what I call sampler sets. And sometimes I see three or four samplers. They're almost identical. And I said, this poor girl had to repeat it every year. The same sampler. These are um, this you think this one is uh, an example of a sampler by. Uh, Caroline um, Newbold, and you can see there, this is the most common that, you know, they did a real simple alphabet sampler and then moved to something with a verse and a border and, you know, more sophisticated um, uh, design and motifs. All right. So now we get to the meat of <laughs> their presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, well, maybe more than a little bit, about um, schoolgirl samplers from Kathleen. Uh, this is the oldest sampler that's in the collection of the Hadley Historical Society. It has alphabets and verse, like we, we talked about, that kind of sampler, stitched by Polly Kellogg in 1795, when she was nine years old. And it has a verse on it, which you can read, this needlework of mine can tell. When I was young, I learned well, and by my parents I was taught not to spend my time for naught. She did not make that up, her teacher did not make that up. That appears on lots of samplers from all over the English-speaking world. It's, uh, it's kind of a common, common thing or some variation of that. So very, uh, and the reason I say things like that is because I don't want to spread myths. Oh, isn't that cute that you wrote that little poem? That's not the way it was. These are assignments. Think, um, you know, some middle school kid today being assigned to do a PowerPoint presentation and they pull this in and that in and, you know, there's constraints, there's things that expected to do. This sampler also, she was expected to do that. She didn't make it up. Um, because Polly stitched her age and the year that she made the sampler, we have clues to, um, uh, to identify her. Uh, Allen's genealogical research um, suggests that Polly Kellogg was born Mary Kellogg. Polly's a common nickname for Mary. And um, uh, on July 25th, 1785. And this Mary Kellogg would have been nine when she um, uh, dated her sampler uh, sometime between before July 25th, 1795. She would have been nine years old. And then at July 25th, 1795, she turns 10. Um, so that tells us that it was probably done before July, before her birthday. So Mary Kellogg was the third child of Joseph and Jerusha, Jerusha, Jerusha um, Kellogg and the, of uh, Amherst, and she married Luke Waite, um, uh, and, and they had some children. I won't go into that because I think Alan might share, share more, and I'm not going to take that away from him. But. Um, the interesting thing is that um, I haven't found any evidence of her actually being in Hadley, so I'm not exactly sure how. She wasn't born in Hadley, and uh, her family was living in Amherst, so I, I suspect that maybe she uh, had friends or relatives and was staying and, and went to school with, with them. Uh, but clearly uh, it was done in Hadley, and you'll see more and more why we know that to be true. Um, I, and I should say that uh, I, I am looking at these samplers, have decided to group them or to make sense of them for me. So this is what I'm sharing now is the first group. And um, then the second group will have some significant differences and I'll tell you what they are. So this is um, <clears throat> two more samplers, uh, um, one of which is uh, in the historic uh, Northampton collection, and one of which is in the Hadley um, Historical Society collection, both by girls um, with the last name Warner, and we, we have their um, dates. Uh, Lucy Warner was um, born in 1784, and she made it when she was 11 years old in 1796. And you'll notice that um, if you, you maybe can't read it as well, but what she, she signs it, Lucy Warner's Ensemble. A, B, 11 years. And um, their signatures are oftentimes helpful in grouping samplers because when you find the exact same signature, and there are many variations, um, then you ha have a clue that these samplers were done under the instruction of the same teacher. Um, and uh, 
this, this signature is the same as the one we just saw. Um, uh, Polly uh, Kellogg said, Polly Kellogg's ensemble, AE, nine years. So it's the same signature, and that helps me to group them and to know that they were done in the same, under the instruction of the same teacher. And unfortunately, um, Polly uh, Warner did not finish her sampler, so we don't know exactly what she had planned, but um, there are uh, similarities enough that I think that it was part of that group. The second, uh, oh, I, first I wanted to mention some key things. Uh, this is, I guess, part of Sampler 101 also. It's like, what to look for in samplers, and how do you know that they might be part of the same group? So one of the telltale tell, tell things in this small group are the alphabets that they share. They're the same font, if you will, and also the number sequences. There are lots of ways to do numbers. And so when you see numbers done the same way in, uh, across samplers, more likely, again, they were done in the same school or under the instruction of the same teacher. And as I pointed out, then uh, there's a shared signature. And then these two, um, this, this motif shows up on, on two of them as well. And maybe it would have on Polly Warner's as well, but we, she didn't have a chance to put her motifs in, so we don't know. But you can see this motif. Now, this is what got me really excited about the Hadley samplers. All right, really excited. Because I have not seen this motif anywhere else, ever, on any sampler. I've seen thousands and thousands of samplers. And I have not seen this motif anywhere else. And you'll see that it has, it has a long life. <laughs> and it is highly unique. I call them little pom-pom bushes. <laughs> with two birds pecking at the top, pom pom. That's how I see it, and it is very exciting when when you have um, a motif like that that is so similar. All right, keep your eyes open for that. Um, the next group of uh, samplers in in Hadley um, also share some things that we'll point out. One of which is a verse, and it, which reads. Swift as the sun revolves the day, we hasten to the dead. It's kind of <laughs> lugubrious. <laughs> it's not, not a happy thing, but, um, and again, she did not put this, her teacher assigned this to it. And it's part of a whole mentality of preparing to die because life is fragile and you never had, you didn't have much expectation about how long you would live. Uh, so there was a mentality of, well, let's start early getting ready to die. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this verse shows up on Polly Warner. This is the same Polly Warner who did the unfinished sampler um, and the previous group, by the way. Remember I said they did multiple samplers. So we have an example here. And if you're looking at it, you can easily see the pom-pom bush with the birds on it, right? Mm -hmm. So immediately you can see that, pick that up. She has, she has other motifs, um, and uh, she has a nice band, uh, a decorative band across the middle, and then another one at the bottom, and then she has these nice motifs, and look at the shape of the uh, frame around her signature. All of these things become meaningful when you see groups of samplers. In, in a single one isn't so, so um, exciting. So the verse that um, shows up on Polly Sampler and also on others, um, it is the first two lines um, in the uh, first stanza of a five stanza poem that was written in 1704. It was by a well-known British poet, Isaac Watts. And um, the title of the poem is The Life of Souls. And it's uh, dedicated to Dr. Thomas Gibson. I actually don't, didn't look him up, so I don't know who he was. The verse appears on other American samplers, not just these. Um, in fact, it was very popular um, by a teacher, Alice Waters, in Newburyport, Massachusetts, uh, in the 18th century. So it's, it uh, shows up. Now, interestingly enough, since you know, obviously that's a long one, and when it shows up in other samplers, it's not just the first two lines. So. 
when in this sampler and in the others that you'll see, it's only the first two lines. So I think there was somebody who made the first two lines more popular, or helped to make them popular. And I believe it was this woman here, Elizabeth Rowe. Uh, she was also a poet. Um, she had a, um, she uh, published in 1739, there was a publication of miscellaneous poems, that some of which she wrote and some of which she collected. And this, the first two lines of that poem are in, in there. And we didn't, I did not, had not heard of her, I didn't know her, and most of you maybe not either, but she was extremely popular in England and in the English-speaking uh, world. She uh, was greatly admired, in fact, they, they um, referred to her as, you know, like the, the ornament of her sex of this age, <laughs> things like that. So uh, she was very well known for her poetry. So I think the fact that she included it in her collection, and that was widely, I had multiple editions published, I think that that might have helped, and, and maybe that the teacher had a copy of that book. All right, so, um, from Polly Warner's, there are some things to look, uh, look out for. First of all, I mentioned the two bands, and then there are three motifs. Um, the the pom-pom motif, and then in the center, there's this nice, well, I think it's a nice, I look at little pots with um, spade-shaped um, uh, leaves. And then on the left, there's, this is a motif, I don't know how to interpret it, I call it the ink blot leaves. <laughs> because I don't know really what it's supposed to represent. Um, on some of them, the, the flowers are colored a little bit like strawberries, but it doesn't look like a strawberry plant to me. So I just, you, you see what I mean, right? You'll see, and you'll pick it up, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, there's uh, three other samplers. Um, in this uh, group two, and um, you, you can see the one on the left was by 11-year-old Mary Smith. She did that in 1804. She's the daughter of Eno Smith and Mary Cook. And then uh, in the middle, there's uh, one done by Jerusha West uh, in 1806. And then uh, at the, on the right, there's one by 10-year-old Elizabeth Edward Smith and in 1808. Okay, so those, those are the three. The ones on the left and the right are from the Hadley Collection are over here, so you'll get a chance to see them. And one in the middle is from uh, Historic Deerfield Museum, which, interestingly, they have some Hadley, nice Hadley franchise. So, um, looking at all four of those, you can, all four of them had this band, okay, this trefoil motif within a kind of a serpentine. Um, bordered like band. Okay. All four of them have the pom pom bush with the, tr the birds pecking at it. You see why I think these belong in a group, right? I mean, how could you not? Uh, <clears throat> all four of them have this nice, elegant little basket pot with um, spade like leaves, or as you can see, one of them is, a couple of them have stitched them like strawberries. Again, I don't think they look like strawberries, but <laughs> strawberries were popular. And all four of them have the ink blot leaves on a, on a bush. All right, okay. Now you can see why I was kind of excited. Now one of the things I want to point out is that, remember we saw the pom-pom and the spade leaves, the pot with the spade leaves, in group one. And then we saw them on all the samplers in group two. So it would be logical to say, maybe it was the same teacher in group, for group one and group two, and that's possible. But the sampler appearance changed so drastically um, that if you remember, it became so much more sophisticated. And see, and it's included the verses, it included all these motifs, it is, they're all stitched better, you know, they're more sophisticated in their stitching. It feels like a different teacher to me. Yeah. You don't have to agree, but. <laughs> all right, and then the, the third group, um, this sampler was made by Dorothy C. Cook. You've probably seen it on all the advertisements. 
Um, and it was made in 1827. So now we've skipped a time period, right? We were talking about the early, the early um, teens, or not even into the teens for that second group. Now we stitched the skipped several years, and I don't know what was happening with respect to samplers in between at this moment. But um, <clears throat> Dorothy Cook uh, did this sampler in 1827. She has a nice uh, verse on there. May prudence point out wisdom's way, or still reclaim me when I stray. May virtue guard my youthful part when vice and folly throw their dart. So maintaining virtue and being uh, prudent and stuff, these were big, high, highly important values uh, for women of the day. It's a modified version of a section from a much longer poem by Nathaniel Cotton. And he was an English physician who also wrote poetry and published his poetry. And this, this came from a book called Friendship, um, a, a poem called Friendship in a book called Visions in Verse for the Entertainment and Instruction of Younger Minds, which I, I think that's a great title. And that was published in 1751. Um, and the original uh, verse that the stanza this came from had uh, six lines instead of four. And the remaining two are temperance, which was another important value. Temperance to guard the youthful heart when vice and folly throw the dart. So there's a, other lines in there. OK. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm just drawing attention to the fact that 20 years later, the same pom pom shows up, okay? The same pom pom tree, and um, it uh, so it contains uh, this motif. And how to explain its longevity and its popularity of this motif? Um, it, like I said, it would be tempting to think that it's the same teacher teaching all this time, but um, we know this not to be true, and we know it not to be true because the other sampler in this group which was stitched by Abigail F. Clark, Cook, excuse me, F. Cook. She stitched a similar sampler, and I, I'll, I will share you the two of them together in just a minute to show you some similarities. And on her sampler, she gave us the name of her teacher. The teacher is Miss Paulina, spelled P-O-L-L-I-N-A instead of Pauline, but uh, Miss Paulina um, Sellen. And, um, so it's at, at Miss Paulina Selden's school in Hadley. And so we can look up Miss Paulina Selden and we can say, was she around in Hadley? Could, we, could she have been this teacher who had started the pom pom trees and, and carried it all through? <clears throat> well, no, she can't be. So she was born in 1782. Okay, you can do the math. The first one was 1795. Right? Okay, so she's not teaching then. Um, and she was born in Worcester, Mass. Not, a, not well, That's not that far away, I know, but it's not, not Hadley, not Amherst. Um, she was the daughter of William Sellen and Jerusha Woodbury. She moved to Amherst in 1824. And she's recorded as living with her brother in Amherst in the 1830 federal census. And she's recorded as living in Worcester in um, an 1820 census. So not her, her but her, a person of her age in the family in 1820 census. So when she moved to, um, <clears throat> to Amherst, um, she stayed with her brother. Her brother was Dr. William F. Sellen. He's uh, apparently a very well-known physician of the time. Uh, he's called the esteemed physician in Amherst. He ran a, a water cure facility um, out of his house or near his house, in a building near his house, and there was, supposedly there was a tunnel underneath between the house and the, the cure facility. Um, at any rate, we know that she came to, uh, to live with her brother, meaning she was not here earlier. So she could not be responsible for the earlier samplers. So there's some other explanation. But when she was here, we know she was teaching at least from uh, 1825 to 1830 and maybe a little bit longer, um, and she died in 1835. So we have these two samplers in this group, 
And you can see a, a couple things to, to point out. You know, there are some differences, but there are also some similarities. And particularly look uh, at the, the um, beaded kind of uh, enclosure around the uh, verse. That is qu quite distinctive. I look for things I don't see on other samplers, because that tells me that you know, there's some important happening. Uh, so they, there's uh, that beaded um, uh, divider there. And there's also a scalloped thing. Can you see that? My, my thing is so small, I can't see if I can point. See this scalloped? Oh, like this. This up here. Underneath there. There's a kind of a scalloped thing under their name, or around the name, around the signature. That's not typical, either. So, draw attention to that. You see the similarities? Now, there's differences, too, but um, there are different, different girls. And oftentimes, they have some choices in what they included in their samplers. Uh, they have a bunch of motifs that they have choices from. Okay. So you see the similarities there. Then, there are also these baskets of fruit. And I think that, the, I, now baskets of fruit are common on samplers, right? You're going to see others in this and they, they, you'll see them on lots of samplers. But what's not common it, is to have the fruit greatly outweigh the basket. You see, we've got a tiny <laughs> basket and you've got fruit that should be falling off because there's nothing supporting it. You see how far out that comes? Uh, way out here? So it, it, it looks like it's on a board. That, that I have not seen that basket of fruit before. So it's, it's different, but it's on both of these samplers. And they both have um, the, the signature motifs of Hadley, if you will. Uh, one has the uh, ink blot uh, leaves, and one has the pop-up, as we pointed out before. And you have to ignore the smiley black line. <laughs> So I think there's uh, a third sampler that you might be able to put into this group. Um, again, it's unfinished, so we don't know for sure. Some of the things that um, she did um, suggest that it might be under the instruction of the same teacher. Um, this is from, this is Marianne uh, Warner-Smith, and it's possibly the same uh, group. Um, she was born in 1817, so she probably made this sampler about 1827, so we're talking about the same time period. And we know that she was in Hadley, so it's very possible. And I draw your attention to the beaded thing on top of her little verse. So it's a different uh, variation of including that little beaded uh, band, but I think it's a, a possibility that she might have been in the instruction of the same teacher. Just possible. Okay, so so we've seen three groups, and now I have three outliers. These don't fit into groups, but they're so fascinating that I wanted to share them with you as well. Um, so there's uh, three samplers here, um, and in do in sharing them, you'll also get a taste of the kind of research that we do about samplers, trying to figure out, you know. Where, what is this sampler, and where did it come from, and who's this girl? You'll get a taste of that because each one has a little bit of a different problem. Most of which is not resolved, by the way. So the first outlier is this one. It's a sampler stitched by Eliza Kellogg. I mean, the Kelloggs are all over here, right? Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that name doesn't sound strange at all. She didn't tell us when she worked her sampler, but she did tell us that she was in Hadley when she stitched it. This is in the collection of uh, Historic Deerfield. And they estimate that it was made around 1800. I don't know what evidence they used um, to make that estimate, but that's what they have on it. And it's not an unreasonable guess. To see if I could locate an Eliza Kellogg in Hadley, because those are the two pieces of information we have to go on, right? Um, <coughs> I searched available online genealogical databases, starting with a possible birth date as early as 1750. In other words, I you know, really tried to reach out and try to not make assumptions of when, when she might have been born. 
So the first and only girl with this name recorded in Hadley between 1750 and 1820, because I didn't think it was later than that, was the daughter of Martin and Hannah Kellogg of Hadley. So there, there was a, an, a, an Eliza Kellogg. I can't tell you for sure if, if it's the girl who made this, but it's a possibility. She was born um, July 12, 1807, and was the fifth of their 12 children. Uh, according to Massachusetts vital records, she married uh, Louis Draper of Amherst when she was 22 years old in 1839. So, and it kind of fits with the, what, we, what we know about the sampler and um, what you might date it. Um, interesting to know, you pick up all kinds of interesting tidbits when you do this genealogical research. So according to the 1850 census, Eliza's um, husband, Louis Draper, 49 at the time. He was a merchant and he had $3,500 worth of real estate. That's a lot in that time. That's really, that's a lot. Um, and at that time, Eliza Kellogg, um, had, they had uh, four children. So now, okay, that's a background. That's what I think. I think she prob was probably it. But I'm really concerned about the sample because it doesn't look like any of the other samplers I've shown you. And it doesn't look like it for some pretty good reasons. <clears throat> um, the ground fabric is very, very tight. And so she cannot stitch her letters and her numbers and her name in the same way that the other girls did. Because the other girls counted their threads. They literally would count a thread and go, okay, go over three, make a cross stitch, go over another three, make a cross stitch, go, or make them together, together, together. They're counting their threads, and they're paying attention to when they stitch. They're stitching them around the threads, okay? counted, counted stitching. Well, she's not doing this at all. This is surface stitching. She's just making her letters and her numbers on there, doing the best she can. And it's not very good, really. <laughs> and the, the other thing that draws, makes this somewhat concerning to me is that um, there are a lot of people who try to make, quote, primitive samplers, and they look like this. Now, why somebody would do this, <laughs> and it, it genuinely looks old, um, and it has things in it that I don't think you would put in if you were trying to fake a sampler, so I don't know, but it has that feeling. And Lynn's in here nodding, so I think she thinks I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is true. It's a very suspect sampler, okay? Now, I haven't told her story to you that yet, but. <laughs> um, so we're not including it in any group. We're not saying it's happening. She says happening. Why would you? Yes? Something that simple wouldn't be worth much. What would be the Oh, thing? I don't know. But there are people who make primitive samplers and they sell them. <coughs> not huge amounts of money. Um, it's just not good enough to even do that. I'm sorry. They're very popular in the 1980s. Uh -huh. So this may be something like that. Maybe even, um, maybe even a relative and said, "I'm, you know, I'm going to put something of Eliza Keller on it again." I, I don't know, but I, I'm telling you, it's a very suspect sample. Have you, have you seen the back of it? No, I, I've just seen pictures of it. So um, this, I, I, oh, I, I've already mentioned this. This was uh, of the census where he. The husband, if in fact it was made by Eliza Kellogg, was a rich man. We'll move on. Now this is a real sample. I'm not going to show you any more fake samples, or possibly fake samples. This is the second outlier. And it was made, but it also presented a puzzle, because it was made by a girl, with, also with the last name Kellogg. It's a family record sampler, and it was stitched by Fanny Kellogg. And although there are many dates on the sampler, including her own birth date of September 24th, 1801, um, and also those of her parents and eight siblings, Fanny did not tell us when she made the sampler. Um, genealogical research, however, has indicated that there was a tenth child born to this family after these nine um, in 1818. So we, if we're going to date the sampler, uh, we can be pretty sure it was after the birth of the last child here, which was February 22nd, 1816, and before the birth of the next child born in the family, 
who is not represented here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And that uh, was August 18, 1818. So I put a circus 1817, but I really don't know when it was. But it's in that time period. Okay. So that's close. So Fanny's parents were Martin and Hannah Kellogg, Hastings Kellogg, which she has um, uh, mentioned on, the, uh, on her sampler. And that may sound familiar to you, uh, maybe I didn't mention, um, the, but Eliza Kellogg, the one that we found after looking at all the possible Eliza Kelloggs for the last fake sampler, or possibly fake sampler, Eliza Kellogg is on this list. Okay, in the list of siblings, we find Eliza Kellogg, Fanny's younger sister, born July 12, 1807. So the girl that we, we came up with, and I didn't know that at the time. I, went, I didn't piece that together until I was putting the, the images together, actually. Um, so she shows up on here, the, the person who was most likely stitched the previous sampler, if in fact it was a, a real sampler. So, but in spite of all the details that we have now here, um, about um, Fanny, and we uh, even know uh, who she, when she married, and I listed that up there, that she married in 1828. Um, she married uh, Theodore Pasco, and it was passed down in the Pasco family before it was um, uh, donated to the Hadley Historical Society. But in spite of all this, we can't answer the question <laughs> of um, did she in fact stitch it at the Amherst Academy. She says Hadley. Normally when you list a town, that's where you stitched it. It's not normally your hometown. It sometimes happens, but it's rare. But, and then she lists Amherst Academy. And I, of course, don't know anything about the area or didn't. And so I was thinking, oh, Amherst ha ha Academy, how weird, that's in Hadley. <laughs> but not true. Ellen set me straight, said, no, that's, that's, in, the, that's in Amherst. <laughs> um, so, yes, so we have uh, we have uh, Amherst Academy uh, as the most likely school, but it's kind of a, it has a kind of a confusing history too. Um, it it uh, opened in 1814, uh, as we say here. It was founded by a group of um, Amherst citizens concerned for the education of their youth, and they raised money and found property and built the building and opened the school in December of 1814. And at that time, it welcomed both male and female students. And in general, every year, there were about the same number of boys as girls. Um, and like most academies, it had both an English department and a classical department. And the English department was the easier, if you will. And the classical was really kind of designed for those who are going to go on to the, um, college. And, uh, and often for in the ministry, so you had to be really skilled in Greek and Latin for reading the Bible in the original, or not the original, but in um, <clears throat> earlier translations. Um, and both of these departments were open to uh, females uh, as well as males, although in reality most of the women were in the English department. Um, there was definitely a Christian grounding to this school, and, uh, and that is makes sense given the uh, orientation to preparing um, young men for the ministry. Now, in 1824, they kicked the girls out. Uh, that's probably not a very nice way to say it, but um, the, uh, they decided to make it an all-boys school, and the preceptress of the Amherst Academy went with the girls, and they had a school all of their own called the Amherst Female seminary, starting in 1824. So starting in 1824, there wasn't any um, girls at Amherst Academy. Now, you know, we keep in mind, we're looking at a sampler that's dated around 1817. That's why it's really important to kind of get a date for when it is, because we can't say Amherst Academy if it's 1825 that you might have had stitched it, right? Because the girls weren't there. So, and I'll quote you, because I thought that was as important that Hampshire Gazette had, um, an explanation for why they um, discontinued the female department. The trustees of Amherst Academy, having discontinued the de female department in order to render the classical instruction in the same, meaning the same school, the academy, 
more complete. In other words, you can away, taking up space, taking up time. A school for females, independent of the academy, will be opened on Wednesday under the care of the preceptors of the academy, where all the branches of education usual in the higher female seminaries will be taught. And we know what that means, right? It has the needlework and the painting and the, and the, the drawing. And obviously there'll be some academics as well, but they're no longer going to have access to the classical department. And who knows what they had access to as far as the English department. So <clears throat> trying to find Fanny Kellogg um, um, required us to, to try to find uh, information about the students. And there are two types of documents that list students and teachers of these kinds of schools. Uh, the first are exhibition programs, and they, 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 uh, the schools host exhibitions periodically. In this case, it's at the end of the year in November, I think. And students um, show off their learning. So they do recitations and plays and play musical instruments and um, show the community that this was a good investment. Um, and so it lists some of the names of the students and some of the names of the teachers. The one on the left is a uh, program or exhibition program for that. And then the, also some of the schools, uh, these schools and, the, and Amherst Academy published catalogs every year. We don't have access to all the catalogs, but we have access to some of them. And in the catalogs, all the students are named. So you can see the male students, I think the males are on top, and then the females, I can't, I can't see it right now. But um, so you, you can see they're roughly equal, and there's a lot of students there. Fanny is not there. And Fanny's not in the, 18, uh, the 1817 uh, program. That, that doesn't mean she wasn't at the school then, but we don't have a catalog for 1817. So we don't know for sure if she was going to school there. Okay, so this means we can't answer for sure, but you know, she said she was going to the Amherst Academy, so okay, we'll take it at face value for the, for the moment. But there's another question, and that is, did the academy even offer needlework instruction? I showed you what they said. The English department and the classical department get rid of the girls so we can do more classical, right? So did, did it even offer needlework instruction when the girls were enrolled? Well, thanks to Dr. Mar <coughs> Marla Miller, we were able to uncover, she was able to uncover cover some um, newspaper ads and um, uh, that talks about Amherst Academy, talks about its curriculum, talks about its teachers. There were five ads relevant to this time period. Um, the first one is in 1814 when it started, when the schools opened, and it said all branches will be taught. Well, for girls, all branches means needlework, right? Um, on May 10, 1815, uh, the ad clarified that there would be a preceptress and that's the common term for a, te a female teacher, and that she'd been, quote, engaged to assist in the instruction of females. So if you need help, you're a man teacher, and you need help, what do you need help with particularly? Needlework instruction, right? And maybe other things too, but that's probably something he didn't, that male teachers did not have in their repertoire. So to me, that uh, announcement and it occurs several months after the school opened suggests um, they hadn't originally planned maybe to have ornamental branches and uh, realized they needed a, a female teacher. Third one is May 1st, um, 1816, about a year later, and it refers to two upcoming summer sessions, summer quarters, um, and it announces that Mr. Esterbrook is the preceptor and will be assisted by Miss Douglas, who is the person that they hired earlier. And it says, males will be instructed in the learned languages and other branches usual in academies. Females will be instructed in the useful and ornamental branches of female education. <laughs> so by this, it probably does mean that they're teaching needlework. I would, I would assume that that. And that's in 1860. So that's in the, the time period for Fanny Kellogg. And then the last ad that we have, um, uh, this is, announces, um, it's November 14th, 1816, and announces the next quarter, uh, when the next quarter will uh, commence, and it'll continue all the, the same instruction. I also included one on the right, uh, because it mentions Miss Douglas, 
You can see in 1818, that's from the catalog in 1818, and it lists her as the preceptress. So where is all that going? So that's going to say that um, if Fanny Kellogg attended Amherst Academy, um, uh, she most likely was taught by Miss Lucy Douglas. Who was Miss Lucy Douglas? So we had to find out if, who, who she was, and um, it turns out um, our research revealed that she was born in Westfield, Mass., uh, which is, as you guys all know, but I didn't know, <laughs> less than 30 miles from Amherst. And she was the daughter of Thomas and Temperance uh, Douglas, also of Westfield. Um, and uh, when she was 24, she began teaching at the Amherst Academy. All of this is documented separate from uh, these other references that I, that I mentioned. Um, and this is a picture of the Westfield Academy. It didn't open until 1800, 1799 or 1800. Um, uh, and the ad on the right indicates that Miss Lucy Douglas is back teaching at is teaching at Westfield Academy and may have taught there previously. So by the spring of 1819, um, Lucy Douglas has returned to her hometown and is teaching in the Westfield Academy. Um, and most likely she had been a student at the Westfield Academy and then was hired to teach at the Amherst Academy. Uh, but she didn't teach there very long. On um, less than a year, she married James Lyman Fowler, who is Esquire, who is apparently a really um, an important person who was also of Westfield, and he um, he was a well-known, successful gentleman farmer. He was also on the board of trustees of the Westfield um, Academy, and also of the Amherst College on the board of trustees. So he's very, very uh, connected. Okay, so we now the, to sum up, Fanny Kellogg <laughs> Sandler was most likely stitched at Amherst Academy, but we can't prove it. Um, if it was stitched at Amherst Academy, Miss Lucy Douglas was her teacher. All that for that. Um, I was curious to see if we could find any samplers that might have been done at the Amherst Female Seminary. That's this time period between, and I didn't tell you, that the time period stopped in 1838. This, this seminary was only going from 1824 to 1838. And the reason for that is it burned down. So it burned down in 1838, and then the girls had to be accepted back at Amherst Academy. Okay? So, but I, and I did run into this sampler, which is at the Amherst Historical Society, and it's dated 1825, and um, I did some research to find, I believe this Pamela Dickinson was the daughter of Chester, Dickinson of Amherst and his wife Susanna, who I think was from Hadley. Um, I don't have life dates for Pamela yet, um, but her parents married in 1803, and she's the second of their three kids. So being born around, you know, 1810 or so, um, and make, having doing this around 1815, puts it in the academy range. She's not doing this, and this looks like an academy kind of piece. So it's, it's very possible we need more examples, but it's possible that it could be, have been done at the Amherst um, Female Seminary that, during that period. And then the third outlier is um, uh, a memorial sampler, I'll call it a sampler, to Reverend Samuel Hopkins. Um, and this may be a name that's familiar to all of you, it was not to me. Um, Samuel Hopkins was the fourth minister of the church in Hadley, and he began his service there in February of 1755. Uh, about a year later, he married uh, the widow, Sarah Porter, and uh, at that point in time, she already had five children and then went on to have nine more with him. Oh. <laughs> Big man. Um, Samuel Hopkins served as minister uh, in Hadley for almost um, 60 years until February of 1809 when he was struck with paralysis and that apparently impaired his mental faculties and he died in 1811. So this memorial was stitched after his death um, and I'm guessing it was stitched either by somebody in his church who could have um, wanted to honor him with this I'm very intrigued by the open area up there, but I don't know what, it's a little early 
to think you'll stick a photograph there, but <laughs> that's what it calls out to me. <laughs> um, uh, or it's possible that it was stitched by a student at Hopkins Academy, which I haven't mentioned before, but um, as you guys all know, Hopkins Academy was an academy in Hadley. And Samuel Hopkins was a trustee on the Board of Trustees for Hopkins Academy. So just very briefly, um, Hopkins Academy was originally founded apparently as a grammar school and academy, only for boys originally, um, due to a bequest by Edward Hopkins, and he was apparently a 17th century merchant and never was in Hadley, and, but he bequeathed money for education, and he says his bequest was designed to, quote, give some encouragement in those foreign plantations, that's us, <laughs> for the breeding of hopeful youths, both at the grammar school and college for the public service of the country in future times. So it's kind of forward looking. Originally only admitted boys, but the, uh, and originally for the express purpose of preparing them for the ministry, um, but um, later admitted uh, girls. Leap forward. Um, as I <coughs> said, we can uh, gather information from school catalogs and newspaper ads. Um, uh, we can we learn uh, that there was a very uh, active uh, uh, teacher, Miss Louisa Billings, at a time when some of the girls who did some of those samplers went to Hopkins Academy. Okay. So there's girls who are doing these with in maybe a, lo a local school and then moving to an academy. So the two girls are Mary Ann Warner Smith and maybe others, but uh, the catalogs I can locate, I can find <coughs> these two girls and Dorothy Cook. Um, then later went to Hopkins Academy. And the, t the preceptors, the, 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 actually she became principal, Louisa S. Billings. Um, appears in the catalogs for some time. She was um, the uh, fir first a teacher in 1830, and um, by 1832 she was listed as, as a principal, which is highly unusual. They, it, it's very rare to find a female teacher listed as anything other than a teacher or preceptress. To be listed as principal is a big thing. So she must have been competent. And she <laughs> taught there, or, and or was principal there. The principals taught also to 1835. And as I said, during this time, at least two sampler makers from Hadley attended. Um, needlework is mentioned in some of the documentation, not a lot, but we did see an ad in the Hampshire Gazette in 1829 that lists needlework as a subject of instruction. So we have reason to believe that um, that kind of thing continued. And again, in 1849, that's a big gap, 29 to 49, the school's ad lists drawing and um, needlework. So. It is possible um, that the outlier, the memorial that uh, to Samuel Hopkins was stitched by a student or uh, at, at the school. I couldn't come up with any samplers that were stitched, um, that clearly were stitched at Hopkins Academy. Nothing says that and I can't find any connection between any other samplers yet and the list of students that I have access to. But I did find this family record um, it done by Ebenezer Kellogg from Hadley when he was about 15. And um, he, we, he, because it's a family record, we know that uh, who his father was. His father was Giles C. Kellogg, uh, who was a teacher at Hopkins Academy. And so Ebenezer would have been a, 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 a about 15 at this time when he made this. And we know that he was a student around that time. I don't have a catalog for the exact same year, but he was a student around that time. So I believe that this was probably done at uh, the Hopkins Academy. Okay, last section, which is really a uh, brief overview of uh, the, the community a little bit. I, when, when you're looking at a group of samplers, and you're trying to figure out what's distinctive about it, you have to look at samplers from other places as well, because if it looks just like this one and this one, then you don't have anything distinct. So in preparing this for you, I also tried to find samplers from other communities around, and I found a lot more than I'm gonna share with you, but it's, this is designed to give you a flavor 
of what was happening at the same time as the, some of the samplers that you've seen that were uh, being stitched in Hadley. So um, this map was probably for my own edification, not yours, because you probably know where all these towns are, but I wasn't exactly sure. <laughs> Um, and so we've seen some things from Ham Amherst, we've seen some things from Hadley. Let's go across the Holy <coughs> Range and see something from South Hadley, okay? Give you a little bit of a picture of what was happening. So, really different, right? Now this is the same time period as group two, uh, excuse me, yeah, group two of the samplers that we looked at. You'll notice no pom-pom trees. You'll notice no ink blot uh, bushes with <laughs> ink blot leaves. These are uh, silk on silk embroideries. There are three of many known from this school. The school was run by Miss Abby Wright, um, and who was from Connecticut. Uh, she ran this very well-known school, um, drew students from all around as well as from locally. And she specialized in teaching this fine art of silk on silk embroidery, which I understand, I'm not a stitcher, but I understand is like the hardest stuff to do because uh, silk is so difficult to embroider on. Uh, the scenes that are depicted on these samplers were of two major types. <clears throat> One type is biblical or literary. In other words, it refers to some kind of something that they were reading. Uh, or had, had read. And then the other are mourning embroideries. There are a lot of mourning embroideries. These embroideries where people are mourning their dead loved ones or somebody famous. Uh, so the, as you can see, two of those are one by Sophia Morgan and one by Eliza Eli or Ellie um, are both mourning embroideries. Um, Abby writes, uh, Academy was located at, on the site of what is now Mount Holyoke Observatory. And uh, her letters and her memoirs are in the Mount Holyoke College Library. Um, and so, and then reading those kind of reveals what her goals were for the girls that she taught. She wanted to lead them, quote, in the paths of rectitude and virtue, that they may establish an unblemished reputation and become ornaments to society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the process, um, young women attending her school received an academic curriculum to some extent, and also uh, uh, quite a variety of ornamental arts, such as this embroidery. And there are many in mourning embroideries taught at many different schools, but this is the telltale feature of Abby Wright's um, school, is this, um, excuse me, coiled silver uh, metal thread. You can see on the top of the, on the urns. So she married, uh, she taught from 1803 to 1809, and she married in 1809, and at that time her half-sister, Sophia Goodrich, who had been earlier been her student, took over the school and ran it for a, a few more years. Uh, this is a sampler uh, from, uh, uh, we'll go to the other side of the river now, the other side of the Connecticut River. By the way, I went, I went to school in Northfield, and we were always trying the other side of the river, and that's where the boys were. <laughs> so I, I, I have this really strong image of the other side of the river. So now we go to the other side of uh, the Connecticut River, and on the north, Williamsburg. Um, uh, that at this point, this is the only sampler I know of from that area, and it was stitched by Sarah H. Warner. Warner obviously is a big name in this community as well, in uh, 1829. She was actually born in New York um, in 1820, and then the family moved to Williamsburg, where she clearly stitched her sampler, because she tells us she did, and um, later married John Clark Reed in 1851. Now, remember I told you there are lots of uh, baskets with uh, fruit on, on samplers, and you can see a bunch of them here. She really liked that. Um, and you can see that they're very different than the other baskets. You know, they're not hanging off the edges, they're not piled high like uh, this, uh, some are. They're, you know, they're just kind of nice little sedate baskets of fruit, right? And she gave us at least four or five of them. Um, <clears throat> quite distinctive in this sampler, though, are the two buildings on the, on the bottom, and the, the buildings with many windows. I don't know what they represent, if they even in 
fact represent actual buildings. Um, but that would be something to, to research or somebody who knows something about Williamsburg to, to research. Okay, a little further south is Hatfield. And um, the sampler on the left was stitched by Sophia um, Smith um, in 1806. Uh, she was the daughter of Joseph and Lois White Smith, as she tells us, on her family record sampler. And was the fourth of their seven children. She was born in 1796. Um, and all of that's recorded on her family record. What's not recorded is that upon her death, and you guys may all know all of this, she inherited, um, had inherited a fortune, quite a large fortune, because she outlived her parents, and she outlived all her siblings. So that, that's, that's the key. Outlive all your siblings. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she bequeathed the Smith family fortune to be used, and I quote here, the establishment and the maintenance of an institution for the higher education of young women, with a design to furnish for my own sex means and facilities for education equal to those which are afforded now in our colleges to young men. Um, and the resulting institution, of course, was Smith College. And Smith College donated the sampler to the Hatfield Historical Society. On the right is a very similar um, family record and stitched uh, about the same time, 1806, and it was stitched by Hannah Wells. It's clearly done, you, you can see this now, right? It just jumps out at you. It's clearly done by the, uh, under the instruction of the same teacher. You look at those borders, you can, you can see the similarity in the, in the borders. Um, and they're both family records. Hannah uh, was born in 1790 so that's a year before Sophia. And um, she was the youngest daughter of Amasa. Is that how you say that name? Amasa or Amasa? I don't know. Amasa. I say Ma. Okay. Amasa, Amasa. Wells and Eunice White. And Eunice White was a distant cousin of Lois White, Sophia's mother. So they both uh, were white. Um, and as an adult, Hannah married Joseph Smith, who was Sophia's older brother. So these two girls, not only did they sit next to each other in class, right? Um, they were close to each other at any rate. Um, they also had, their mothers were related and um, Hannah clearly had a thing for Sophia's brother because they ended up getting married. So they knew each other well and went to school together and ended up as sisters-in-law. Can I ask a question about this one? Yeah, sure. On the right, I'll give just go back. Uh, is that a garden plot in front of our house? Is that right. like perspective? I don't know. I wondered the same thing. It's, yeah. it's unique. I have not seen that particular kind of... Some samplers do have um, yards that are done in perspective. So it's, it's very possible. I don't, I don't know. You're, that, that's what it looks like to me, too. No, I can't really see that more, so... Uh -huh. Can't make it bigger for you at the moment. Uh, okay. Um, one other one of interest in Hatfield, or interest to me anyway, is this one by Polly Geary. It's an alphabet and verse um, sampler. It's fairly simple um, and possibly done under the instruction of the same teacher. And uh, the evidence for that is the use of the same font for her text and also the distinctive cartouche that frames the signature. If you go back and look at this, you see that their signatures are in uh, these little cartouches, little funny shaped things, and they're fully stitched behind the name, right? Okay, and that is what we see in uh, Polly Geary's as well, and if I pull them all together for you, um, you can see, this is unusual. I mean, I'm, I'm pointing out something. This does not happen on samplers very often at all, okay? So, in fact, uh, but it, it does happen around here. It has, it's happened in these Hatfield samplers. And you can see the shape, especially Polly's, is kind of similar to the ones on Hatfield, but they're, they're fully stitched in the back. And the same is true for many samplers stitched in Deerfield. Uh, they also have this stitch. And in Northfield also, there's some. I didn't have a good example of that, but it's... This area likes to do that, apparently. 
Now, when you see, when you get used to seeing that and you know that it's unique, then when a sampler comes up that has no identification, but you see it and you go, I know where that was made. Mm -hmm. but I can't find her anywhere. If this is a sampler that's at the National Museum of American History uh, in Washington, D.C., they have expert genealogical researchers. They have not been able to identify the maker. It is also in the sampler archive database, and we have not been able to identify the maker. However, I would be very, very surprised if it didn't come from this area. You can see, there's nothing about it that is that, that claims a different location. Everything about it is consistent with the kinds of samplers that are made in this location. Not necessarily Hadley, but in the general um, Hampshire County or Franklin County <coughs> areas. All right, and last are a set of what I think are just beautiful samplers that were stitched uh, in Northampton. And they were stitched under the instruction of what must have been a very talented, but as yet unidentified teacher. Um, the known examples date from 1803 to 1807. These are, um, uh, and there is an outlier, which I show, will show you, that was dated uh, 1816. But most of them are from, or all the others are from 1803 to 1807. Showcased here are the first three, and you'll see that they all have a similar format, right? You can, you can see the similarities. They have a seam that's stitched inside of an oval that's kind of at the center and underneath the alphabet and the numbers. And then to the right and the left are urns or baskets piled really high with fruit. And um, beneath that then there are some evergreen trees and a verse and her signature. And the, they're all Creative, I think they're all interestingly creative, but following more or less the same format. And what's fun when you see a, a group like this is that you get a sense of what the teacher required and what where the girl got to be the creative, basically. And these girls seem to have a fair amount of creativity in the selection of colors and the seams that they put in the in the center. Um, you'll see others, um, and you'll you'll notice that. Um, and they are totally stitched. All the entire sampler the background is has these long stitches on it. So it's not what what you see behind the letters and all of that is not fabric. It's all silk. Mm -hmm. So they're very very expensive to make as well because they require very you know expensive material. And here is um, other three, two more in that same time period, 1803 to 1807. One of them is a family record, which is um, quite interesting. That's uh, Juliana Fitch. She has a, a made a family record. And the last one on the right, Temperance Clark's, is very similar. It doesn't have the scene inside of an oval and a verse in there. But um, you, can, you can see the similarity in that it's all stitched. And that wasn't done until 1816. So there's this huge gap. And we, it's a, at this moment unexplained, and since we can't identify the teacher, we do not know who's responsible for these charming, charming samplers. Oh, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So the first one was Holly Kellen, 1795. Um, she was the, uh, she, she married Rufus Kellogg, and uh, I mean, sorry, she, her sister was Rufus Kellogg, and Rufus Kellogg married Mary Smith. Mary Smith did the 1804 sample. So we have the Molly Kellogg, 1795, and the Mary Smith, 1804. They were sisters-in-law, okay? Polly Warner, we have two samples by Polly, one in 1799 and one in 1802. Uh, the, uh, and she married uh, Sylvester Smith from Hadley. She had three children, but died in 1817 at 24 years of age, probably in or during after childbirth. And her daughter, who was born the year she died, was Mary Ann Warner, who became Mary Ann Warner Smith, who was the maker of the third uh, sample that we have. Um, and the Polly Warner sample, one of the interesting things about Polly's second sample that she did in 1802 is that it's stitched onto the, uh, uh, the 1802, um, it's uh, stitched onto the Hampshire Gazette edition, I think it was 1802, January 1st, 1802. There's a page of the Hampshire Gazette, and she stitched, for no reason, the sampler onto the back. That was what she backed the sampler on. It's kind of interesting. Um, so, Mary Ann, uh, so Polly had, uh, his daughter was Mary Ann Warner. And, uh, uh, she was born in Hadley, buried in Old Hadley. Oh, before I leave uh, Polly, Polly's husband, Sylvester, after Polly died, married Elizabeth Edward Smith. And Elizabeth Edward Smith is the maker of another Hadley sampler. So they were probably friends. Uh, and the samples are, are quite similar. And then uh, there are two other samplers uh, that we talked about the Fanny Kellogg family register. Um, the, um, we have two samples from Worcester, or from uh, Westboro, for, by Elizabeth Gibbon and Charlotte Gibbon, who uh, were related. They were sisters, but the, one was born in, uh, one made her sample in 1805, and the other one was around 1850. The connection to Hadley is that, um, that uh, Charlotte's, Charlotte Gibbon married a John Gibbon, okay? And, uh, and I'm sorry, her brother, John Gibbon, married Mary Elizabeth Smith in, from Hadley. And Mary Elizabeth Smith was a granddaughter of Mary Ann, uh, Mary Ann Warner Smith. Uh, so um, they, they're all related. And we got those samplers. Um, we believe most of the samples came to, the, to, to Hadley in 1909. It was the, during the 250th celebration of the town, which was a huge, probably the biggest one up to the 350th, which is the next biggest one. Uh, but in, in 1909, it was a huge celebration. It went on for days. There were thousands of people here and lots of luminaries. And um, there were 30, 30 samplers were exhibited at, at the Russell School as part of the celebration. And we believe that the samplers that we have, most of them were there during that time as well. And, and we know that the, uh, the Mary Ann Warner, uh, the Gibbon samplers, and the Polly Warner samplers were, uh, were donated by Polly, uh, by um, Mary uh, Elizabeth Smith and her sister, Mrs. Helen Stockbridge, okay? They were sisters, and they were granddaughters of, uh, of um, and uh, they were here in 1909. We know they were here because, um, because Helen Stockbridge's husband uh, was the speaker, was the, the, the honored speaker at the 1909 celebration. He was a big shot from, from Baltimore. He was a congressman. And his, his brother was Levi Stockbridge, who founded UMass. So there's a deep Hadley connection with that family. And we believe they brought some of these samples, donated them to the historical room at the Goodman Library. And that's how the Historical Society eventually ended up with them. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is the Dorothy Cook sampler, which is the one, this one here. We just got this last year. And it kind of kicked off our revival of interest in the samplers. And it's gorgeous. 
gorgeous sampler. But Doris, this is an interesting story. Doris and Cook uh, was uh, born in 1816, uh, and, uh, and she created the sampler at the age of 11. She later, she later married Luther, Cook, Luther Hooker from Hadley in 1840, and they had a daughter, daughter named Dorothy Sophia Hooker. Well, Dorothy, unfortunately, Dorothy C. Cook died in, uh, one month after having her daughter. So it's probably complications from childbirth, which is a very common thing with a lot of these women. And then to make it worse, her husband, Luther, died six months later in a well excavation accident somewhere in town. So the, so the daughter was orphaned. She was taken in by her, grand, uh, her grandparents until they died. And then she was adopted by uh, uh, the Carter family, Amherst. The sampler of her mother was given to the younger Dorothy as a remembrance to her mother. It stayed in the family until it was donated to the Hadley Historical Society by the great-great-granddaughter of the, of the sampler maker. So it's like you know, an interesting, interesting story. And of course, Cook is a, there's a million cooks from Hadley. Uh, this one was a Cook with the E, okay? And uh, uh, the story that I've heard is that the cooks in Hadley that don't have the E changed their name around the change, time of the revolution because they felt that the Cook with an E was a little bit too Tory. <laughs> so they dropped the E, and those were the revolutionary cooks. <laughs> so again, thank you so much, Lynn, for coming and giving us this wonderful talk. Thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll have Lynn entertain them, and then we can take a look at the actual sample. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Oh, hi. Thanks for a fascinating talk. I got like a billion questions. <laughs> Do two and you can pick one. Um, there's going to be a Community Preservation Act vote at town meeting coming up to uh, preserve these samplers. But when is the town meeting? May 4th. May 4th. So if you love the samplers and you want to preserve them, come to town meeting and come vote. Um, so my question is about the, uh, how can I put this? The, uh, uh, preservation efforts of well-meaning previous owners of the samplers. Um, do you have a, a feeling about, what, about whether additions should be left on the samplers or taken off for preservation? Um, yeah, I have opinions that? about these things. I'm not, <laughs> as you might suspect, right? <laughs> um, I'm not a conservationist, um, but in general, um, they, there's uh, a desire to leave samplers in as natural a condition as possible. Um, when they uh, have uh, suffered damage that can be rectified without damaging anything else, then that can, that can happen. Sometimes there are stains that can, can be removed. It's important to stabilize them, to put them on some kind of a mat. It's hard for them. I mean, they can, they can live like this in between, um, uh, if, as long as they're laid flat. Um, but if, they're, if you want to have them shown or anything um, or handled, it's better to mount them on a, a fabric-covered acid-free board. Um, they don't have to be framed to, for that. Um, and there are people who specialize in this, and it's one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, and, there, but I feel most strongly <laughs> about uh, people trying to fix them. And there are people who think, um, well, I'll just make it look better by putting the stitches in that have fallen out, or I will color the stitches that now are faded. Those things are really a bad thing to do. Um, yes, I have a pain about that. <laughs> and I think pretty sure, we haven't talked about it, but I'm pretty sure Lynn feels it's like, don't wash it. Yeah, yes, and don't wash them. Although there are some forms of treatment with the hot, where you can hydrate them, but these, these should be done by, by professionals with the right kind of equipment. What about things like the labels? The labels should be taken off. Those are not original to the sampler. Yeah, but Andy, we did have a, a, a report conservation report on that, and she did recommend taking the labels off those, uh, you know, we'll preserve, them, we'll preserve them separately. Right, right. Just like with the, and the newspaper. You can't, you can't conserve it with, uh, and 
it's not, uh, you know, we need to get it on, mounted on Madison Street. So we'll try to preserve what we're taking off, but some of the things will have to be removed. I just wondered what your floor plan is. Yes, way back. What do you know about the materials? Would the teacher have provided the materials? Would the students have had to bring their own thread or, you know, family? So, yeah, that's a good, good question. So most of the samplers, as you probably gathered, are linen, are based are on linen fabric. And um, there's a kind of a myth that, you know, it's all homespun kind of stuff. Most of it's not. Um, sometimes there's really early ones and they're, you can, they're, often kind of irregular. Um, the, the thickness of the, the threads are very irregular, and so they, it suggests that it might be hand-spun and hand-woven. But most of it is fabric that is purchased. And um, sometimes the teachers had stores, basically. They sold the fabrics to, um, to the parents, um, to the family. Um, and sometimes they, uh, the, Sometimes it depends on the formality of the school. Um, sometimes the kids were asked to bring it. I, I intuit this because the fabrics are all different, so therefore I intuit that the teacher asks the, asks the parents to send some linen, you know. So when you see, when you see divergence, it's usually not controlled by the teacher. <laughs> That's my, my yeah. Um, what happened when the uh, girl brought this home from school? You know, they don't put them on the refrigerator like. like <laughs> no, today. no, probably not the refrigerator because they probably didn't have one. <laughs> Did they like? Um, uh, were they proud of them? Did they put them up? Did they showcase them? Did they just yeah. store them? Well, I think all of those things happened. Yes, I think they were very proud of them. It costs money to send your children to school, so um, it, anytime you see a sampler, that's an investment of parent parental income. So they. They had to pay the teacher, and you know, obviously the girl was not just doing that sampler, they were doing other things, so they're paying the teacher. They also do not have access to the girl's labor during that time, so that, that's, that's a cost to them. They have to find somebody to fill in, unless they're you know, quite wealthy, that could, could be a burden for some of the family. And, um, <clears throat> and the materials cost. So, and then the framing cost, if you go to frame it. And many of them are not framed because that's an extra cost. But yes, they're very proud of them. And I will tell you why I, I'm absolutely sure they're, in general, very proud of them. First of all, many of them are framed. And so if they're framed, they're put up on the wall. And right? were they framed then? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. 1800? Oh, yeah. Oh. oh, definitely. Yes. We have framing labels, and we, have, and we know when those framers were in operation, so we, we know. And sometimes it's a relative who's a framer, for example. But yes, they're definitely framed at the time. Now, not all of them all, and that's often a, an expense or an inconvenience. You know, there's no framer nearby or something like that. But a, set, a group of samplers, different kind, samplers from different places that end up, I call them displaced. So these are samplers that travel with their makers. And they travel long distances, like the Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. I live in Oregon, right? So I'm conscious of the samplers that have made it to Oregon. They were, most, of them, most of the samplers in Oregon were made elsewhere. Because by the time Oregon is settled, the sampler making has really not done much. And so they come from elsewhere. And so fi finding the story of how that family got there. It came either with the sampler maker herself or with a descendant. And both kinds of stories. That says a lot. When you are traveling with one trunk, and you can only decide on what will fit in that trunk, and you've taken your sampler and maybe your mother's sampler, whatever, and you've folded it in between the other linens in the trunk, and it's gone thousands of miles with you. I do a whole presentation on this, so it's very, it's, it's actually very emotional for me. Um, and I have traced the route of a sampler from Vermont all the way to, San, uh, to Portland, Oregon. And in addition to being on the ship, they went via Panama. So in addition to train at the beginning and then being on the ship through pa pa Panama, in order to get over Panama, they were in little barks, little boats, tiny boats, because there was no big canal there at, at the time. They were on um, buggies and stuff. They were on mules. Now, the, their bags, they paid $25 for each of their bags and each of themselves to rent a mule 
to go across the Pan Isthmus of Panama to get onto another ship to go up the other side. Now, what you decide to take with you is what you think is important, <laughs> right? Yes, I think they thought they were very important. And, um, and the fact that they came out with the girls or the descendants, I, there's one that's in the San Jose Museum, and the girl did two samplers, and also she had her mother samplers. And she also came through the Isthmus of Panama. She also had that same kind of trip, and she had one, you think you're allowed, you know, allowed one trunk, and she had those three samplers in her. Now, they were not framed. I mean, you know, they, they were not taking up that mountain space, but they're all of them. So, yes, I think they were very valued. I mean, the, the, the parents invested in it, and so, of course, they were very proud when the, when the kids brought those home. Okay. Oh, I have a couple of questions. So you had this 100-year gap between the Hatfield sampler of the 1670s and then to the samplers you spoke about in greater depth. Hatfield at that time was part of Hadley. Um, do you have any sense of what happened in between there? I don't have much of a sense. I mean, I'm just looking at what surfa what's surfaced. There are other samplers that I did not share with you. Um, and I can't remember if they fill in some of those gaps. They, they may well have. Um, I just put up mostly the pretty ones. <laughs> you know, nice pictures and they tell a story. But um, there are, I have unearthed other samplers from Hatfield, for example. Um, and we can go back and look at them and see if that helps tell the story. Um, it, this is just the beginning, really. I mean, I don't really. I'm, this is, these are tidbits of information um, and trying to make sense out of um, just um, sporadic bits, you know, and trying to make some sense out of it because there were hundreds, if not thousands of samplers done in this area. We don't know where they are, most of them. And so we're trying to draw conclusions from what we do have and what we can find. And it's very exciting. Um, when I, I think I mentioned if we've been doing, um, well, maybe I didn't mention. So part of the Sampler Archive Project, we do sam um, Sampler ID days. Did I tell you about that? Yes, OK. We do these Sampler ID days. It's kind of like Antiques Roadshow. And people bring in their samplers. We've been doing this in different states. Right now, we're doing it in Vermont. And what's very exciting, you don't know what's going to come out of the woodwork. I mean, these are privately owned. They've been Most of them have been held by families for hundreds of years, right? Talk about valuing them. The descendants value them also. And sometimes a sampler will come up, and I'll look at it, and it will solve a problem. Right there, I know it has solved a problem. We had three samplers in Delaware when we were doing this that we knew to be done by in the same area, and we thought we knew what area it was, um, but we didn't know the teacher or the name of the school. And a fourth one showed up at a sampler ID day, and it told us who the teacher was and when the, where the school was. I mean, and I, my job, I, you could have picked me up off the floor. I just went and went because it was the answer to a question. I mean, and that kind of thing will happen here. The more, the more it's studied, the more samplers that surface, the more we can find wherever they have dispersed to all over the country or world, um, then you can answer more and more questions. I just, that's why a lot of what I've done is just give you questions. <laughs> what, what is, what's happening here? I don't know all, all the answers. Just one, yeah. More, um, yeah. one more quick um, information about that possibly fake sampler. I've seen a number of those entering the market now. And they were very popular in like the 1980s. And there was one person in particular who was designing and making those. Um, so it is something to be very aware of yeah. these days. Yeah, and there, there are people doing it now too. Right. Um, I, it would be interesting. I, I know of another one kind of like that, but I could, I could never find the girl. Like, I think this might have been kind of the girl. But, um, and I, but it had, we have suspicious. It was just suspicious for these kinds of reasons. And another suspicious one showed up just like it. <laughs> yeah. 
And then, you know, if somebody's just making these suspicious looking sandlers, you know, they think, and for what reason, I'm not sure, but it's not like it, it was, was a kid. It mm -hmm. wasn't because they were faking it to make a lot of money. It was just a, a decoration. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it could even have been made, this one, Eliza Kellogg one, could even have been made by somebody in the family. You know, just wanting to think, oh, we don't have Eliza Sampler, let's make her one. <laughs> it's been known to happen, older women do that. They lose their samplers or their samplers get torn, so they make another one. It's, it's documented, yeah. Um, somewhat related to the issue of making things. Um, as somebody who's ish interested in creating period authentic samplers, when I look at these, the fabric seems very openly, open weave, so that even fabrics available today seem very different. The, the linens that are sold for this kind of work yeah. seem very different. Do you have any advice or ideas on someone who's trying to recreate something closer to that look? I don't do that. There are people who do that professionally, and I'll let Lynn answer their, their question if you have a... I, I've not tried to get that authentic. Um, so I actually, I wondered that myself. I don't know where to get the really open weave. Okay. You know, um, you might check. Like sounds too much too lightweight. Yeah. Um, you might check with like um, some of the really high quality uh, there, I mean, it's part of why when you see a reproduction, you know it instantly. Right. Because the fabric is not right. The fabric is right. It is just not right. And, and usually it's stitched way better than the girl would have done. In other words, it's just much more regular. You know, the, it's a, a woman stitching it, and she's just much more regular, usually. Um, and then also, there's they usually leave too much fabric around the edge. These girls filled every inch to the edge. Okay. And when you see a reproduction sampler and it's got some nice open fabric around it, I mean, you see it yeah. and you know it. Yeah, actually, two of us were wondering about that sampler that's standing upright because it has a border at the bottom, but not around that one. Yeah, right. exactly. So we were wondering if had the original borders been damaged and have been cut off, or was that the We'll find out when we take it out of the frame and yeah. store it. Yeah, no, I think not. Okay. Because you can see the letters and stuff like that. They just stitched right up. So they would have gone right up to the edge. Okay. They just stitched. They just did these for yeah. I've researched about two dozen longbow samplers and <coughs> family histories and pictures and gravestones and all kinds of good stuff. How do I contribute them? Oh, just. <laughs> Get in touch with me. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> yeah. So I'm still stuck on that. At first comment, you just blew me away with these weren't done at mom's knee. A lot of these samplers that we have in Longmeadow are very simple. They're not quite as sophisticated as these. Um, so, does everybody in Longmeadow go off to school, or was, was there ever any marking samplers done so that somebody could yeah. learn how to, to, to put their initials okay. on? So, here's what I think, and, and uh, I think that, I think mothers, older sisters, aunts, grandmothers who lived in, I think there was teaching of uh, alphabets on scrap fabric and scrap uh, silk and things like that at home. You run into some that just have, that just seem more primitive, not in the, not in the <laughs> fake way, it just, they're just simple, very, very simple, and they're often small, and, um, and I, I, it's a good chance some of those were done in, at home. I, for example, have a sampler done by, um, I'm trying to remember, Louis, Louisa Cabot Lowell. Um, she's a descendant of one of the Brahmin, Boston Brahmin families, the Lolo family, right? And on this, very simple, just a little alphabet, her name and her birthday, that's why I know who she is, and, um, and, and her age, that she's 10. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, how nice, this was very early on, oh, she's learning her letters and da 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 da, you know, and they're teaching her letters. Well, it turns out she was doing it at home. She had a much older sister who was her instructor. This was 
She hated it. She hated it. She hated having to take it. She says, I did a very bad job because my sister made me take it all out. And you know how I know this? Because her journals, she started writing a journal at about the same time. And she has stacks of journals in the Massachusetts Historical Society. Wow. I went there to read and said, could I read your journal? And they, they said, sure. And I gave them the number and they came back and said, which one would you like? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm going, well, well, how many are there? And they said, oh, I forget the number, let's say 30. You know, she did it until she died. And she never married, so she had the time to write. And, and I said, how about the first one? <laughs> and yes, so, and, so, and it also disabused me of the ideas that she was learning her letters, because here she's writing, very sophisticated writing. So she already knows how to write at 10, at the same age as she's stitching the stamp. So it's a different skill. Now, maybe some were learning their letters that way. Yeah, could be, I don't know. Um, the other thing is, it's a cultural thing. So I haven't studied the Pennsylvania German samplers very much, but people have. And they say it's much more likely that they're done at home. Now, there are also extended families there, so is that a school? You know, in other words, there's family members, a grandmother, great aunt or something staying there. So the fact that it might be at home doesn't necessarily mean it's at mother's knee. There might be an older person who may even have been a teacher. Um, but I understand that Pennsylvania Germans are much, the samplers, and they're fairly distinctive, much more likely to have been done at, at home than in what might seem like a formal school. But you have to realize schools are all different things. I mean, school could be a woman down the street who's um, a widow and is trying to earn some extra money. She's skilled in needlework. She opens her doors and she runs a school for a few years. And that's a, that's a school. I mean, it's a legitimate school. Others. Samplers are done in public schools. They are labeled public schools. You know, they have the names of the public school on it. Kensington Public School. And we know that. So, uh, yes? When samplers stop being done, I mean, when, why did they fall out of like, the teaching? And when, did, when are the later ends of the Good state? question. So um, it varies depending upon what country you're talking about. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> And it varies depending upon what culture in the country that you're talking about. So in general, we'll say, mid-19th century, they, they pretty much deteriorated. There are some people who said, after 1830, you know, you can't find a good one. That doesn't happen to be true. Um, and so around the middle of the 19th century, um, several things happened. Public schools became much more common and, so, and, and better funded. And they stopped being, public schools stopped being just for the poor. When public schools first came out, they were often just for the poor. And so, the, so people who could afford to pay for education still did. And um, so, that, so when they started being opened up to everybody, um, and everybody started going, their, their curriculum became more the same for boys and girls, and less emphasis on sewing. Also, the sewing machine came out about the same time. Popularity of the sewing machine, not as much need to know all the you know, the handwork stuff. Now, I said it varies by culture because even within the United States, where it kind of, it didn't disappear. I mean, I have samplers from 1780s and 90s done in the United States. I know that for a fact. Um, so it's not like it totally disappeared, but it, it became less of a, a, a common thing for every girl to do it. But in very conservative communities, like the Hutterite community, in the Midwest and uh, Catholic communities where they go to Catholic boarding schools, they, would, they did it up until 1900. And in France, they did it until 1950. So, so it varies a lot. You know, you can't just, and they had sewing machines in France too, but they still continued their samplers. So not, no one explanation is perfect for all things. So, okay. no. so. Okay. thank you all so much for coming. And <laughs> been a great audience. I would, what I'd like to say is that I'm, I'm going to go over to the table and I'll talk to anybody about your sampler. If you are okay with having your sampler photographed, would you take one of these? Put your